Um, I wanted to say thank you all for, for joining us today, both our um, participants and uh, all of our attendees. Um, we undertook recently a, we wanted to take a look at management because that's what the committee is one of our big tasks is making this a better uh, place to work for the people who spend their time like creating legislation and, and working on behalf of the American people. And these are, um, and this has been a challenging place to work for a long time. I think everyone would kind of agree with that. I started here in 2006 um, and there are lots of things that contribute to this um, uh, uh, from, you know, from pay to long hours. Um, but one of the things that makes it a place that people want to stay is good management. Uh, good managers are, really make a huge difference in an office's culture and in uh, and staffers staying here and making a career um, out of their time and you know creating really good policy and really supporting their members and, and doing work on behalf of their constituents. And that's what the committee is tasked to do. We, we, we look at, at best practices and turn them into recommendations. And um, one of the recommendations we got during one of our, um, like a member day was the idea that we should be surveying the best managers. Um, and we should be asking them how they do what they do and, uh, and, and, and how we can recreate that. Because some of the things that we look into are not just rules changes, but are culture changes. And so we wanted to ask the people who have done a great job of creating culture amongst their teams, um, how they did it and, and how uh, other people can sort of write, uh, replicate it. And so we, we asked the offices with the lowest turnover um, to send us to take a fill out a survey and to send us some notes on what they think um, they do well and what other offices could replicate. And it was really great. And if you want to see it, um, we have it. It's going to, Ananda, if you're here, would you mind dropping the link in the, in the chat? It's got some really interesting things in here that um, you can either take to your manager or if you are a manager, try to implement into your office. I'm sure that all of the, the chiefs on this call would be more than happy to talk with you about some of their recommendations. Um, and, you know, and I think that if, 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 if we are able to get some of these put in place, I think that we can continue to make this a better place to work. So, um, with that, I want to start off with sort of an open, like an introduction and an open-ended question, and that is, um, if you would, if our if our panelists say, well, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, so well, I should introduce myself first. So my name is Yuri Beckelman, and I'm the staff director on the Select Committee on Modernization. Um, we've been in existence for almost three years now. Um, we are tasked with making recommendations on improving operations, um, rules, and 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 the, and the things that make this place work. Um, and we've passed 97 recommendations in the last Congress and I've passed 20 recommendations in this Congress, many of which have been implemented um, and many of which are in the process of being implemented. Um, and with that, I'm gonna kind of go around the horn and, and if you wouldn't mind just saying, you know, what, what office you're in and maybe a little bit about your background about how you came up and, and, and examples of management you saw that were successful that led you to where you are now, that'd be really appreciated. So I'm gonna kick it off with, uh, with one of my colleagues, Moutre. Uh, thanks, Yuri. Um, yeah, happy, happy to do this and, and sit down uh, with, with everybody. Uh, my name is Moutre McLaren. Uh, I'm with uh, William Timmons from South Carolina, who uh, serves as, as the lead Republican on the Modernization Committee. Um, William is a guy that um, is is sincerely interested in in helping this place operate uh, more effectively. And, he, and I think he puts at the top of that list having people get to know one another. Um, so that's sort of what drew him to the committee. Um, fortunate to be asked to, to be involved here. Um, I worked in the South Carolina delegation for five or six years. Um, prior to joining William's team, was was at OMB uh, for a couple of years too. Anyway, so I've seen uh, the way a few different um, governmental offices run, um, and have kind of tried to bring that to our team. Um, I guess number one theory, which you might hear from me a couple times today, is is um, hire professional people and treat them like professionals. Um, that's sort of our guiding theme, and, uh, and and what we've tried to implement. And so far, so good. Um, anyway, I'll turn it over to whoever's next. Great, Van, you want to take over? Thanks, Yuri. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Van Norella. I'm Chief of Staff to Congressman Andy Levin. Thanks so much for uh, having me here, and congrats on the great work, Yuri, you guys are all doing, That's, uh, and, and Mutre. Uh, you guys are doing a fantastic job, and this is a great report. Um, 
so I, uh, I got to the hill in 2000 and sort of worked my way up with a little detour after uh, about eight years um, on the Hill, went into the Obama administration uh, for all eight years and then came back. Um, and so uh, a lot of the sort of advice and things that I talk to people about generally has to do with, is sort of born of that experience, starting as an LC, as a junior staffer, uh, and then working my way up. Uh, and I, I will tell you, my, I was very lucky. My first uh, uh, chief of staff and LD when I worked for Congressman Peter DeFazio at the time, uh, it really imprinted on me. And, and uh, I, I, I owe a lot to, to their leadership. Um, but happy to talk about other things. I will tell you, uh, I've sort of crystallized what I wanna uh, highlight in, 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 I believe in the rule of three. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Involved, uh, though, you know, increasingly three is becoming five. So three is the new five, perhaps. But for these purposes, uh, I, I sort of look at it as involve, communicate, and invest. And I'd be glad to unpack some of that as we move forward. Absolutely. You know, there, there's sort of two pots here, right? For, for managers, we both on Capitol Hill, we both have to actively create culture, um, but we also have to deal with, um, with what's perceived tradition, right? There is sort of a tradition on this hill of that we, uh, we drive our staff real hard, we make them, you know, we make them miserable, and that's how they become competent. And that is a really tough situation that has not led to the outcomes that we want. So how do we kind of balance those two? Um, Ryan, if you wouldn't mind taking over. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Ryan Carney. I am Chief of Staff to Congressman Brian Stile, who represents uh, Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, I opened his office uh, when he was elected in 2018. Prior to that, I was Chief for four years for Congressman MacArthur. Uh, uh, he was a member from New Jersey for four years. Uh, we had very limited turnover until he lost, and then we all, <laughs> that Mr. Kim didn't want to keep any of us. Um, so, uh, but before that, um, that was actually my first official job on the Hill. Before that, I was at the National Republican Congressional Committee. Uh, so I came kind of a unique ro a route to be a chief of staff. Um, and it was there, um, and you'll hear me talk often about this uh, this afternoon. Um, in my opinion, culture um, that you build is the most important thing um, to retaining good staff. And um, part of that is um, communications and transparency. Uh, I, I truly believe politics and public service and working on the Hill is a, is a team sport. And if everybody knows their role on the team and why the, the, whoever the, the captain of the team is making a certain decision and um, the, either the chief or the member is transparent and overly communicative and builds a culture, um, then you're going to retain good people. Yeah, you know, there, there is often a feeling of loss of control over your day to day and you don't understand why you're doing something as a staff assistant or an LC or a legislative assistant and, and and the work isn't as meaningful if you don't if you feel like you aren't a part of the decisions being made and when when uh, when the office gets wins um, you are more excited about coming to work the next day if you feel like you were a part of that win and siloing it so only the legislative assistant that was handling that issue feels like they get the win doesn't, you know, doesn't create that culture. So I think that's a really, really important uh, point to make. Uh, Paige? Thanks, Yuri. I'm sorry about the, the tech issues getting on today. You'd think <laughs> after a year and a half, we'd have Zoom figured out, but I apologize. We get made fun of so much. My headphones have problems and I call into places and they're like, but you're the modernization committee. And I get like hazed about it. It's not, it's not particularly fun. <laughs> yeah, it happens. It certainly happens. Um, well, thanks again for having me. I'm Paige Hutchinson. I'm Chief of Staff to Congressman Colin Allred, and uh, I helped set the Congressman's office up after he was elected in 2018. And uh, before that, I was his campaign manager. So uh, compared to these folks today, I am very new to the Hill, uh, but I really believe that one of the reasons our office has been successful is because of the other amazing experienced chiefs on the Hill that I really leaned on. Uh, my background being in managing campaigns, I was used to building teams that were, you know, stood up very quickly and built for the short term. And I really focused on, you know, setting up a long term sustainable organization this time. And 
um, did that by hiring slowly and leaning on other chiefs for, for best practices. So thanks, Yuri. Looking forward to talking more. Yeah, the, the, I, I love that last point you made. We're in the process of hiring uh, a, a clerk right now. And hiring slow is an, an important point to make, taking your time. If you feel like you don't have the candidate that is perfect for your office, I always say, go out and do a second round. Let's spend the time, get the right person. And it's much harder to separate someone than it is to spend a few extra weeks or maybe a month getting the like the right person that's going to fit into your culture. That's a, that's a good call out already. Um, you know, I think uh, what I would like to say to sort of to, to um, our attendees today, this is the, the notes that you hear during this are really important. I started out as a staff assistant. I was an intern before that, obviously um, came up through the ranks. And before I was a manager, I mentally took notes of, good management practices and of bad management practices. And I told myself that if I became a manager, I would implement the, the, the good things and leave out the bad things. And I tried to actively do that. You don't always live up to your own expectations, but you can take these practices that other chiefs have had success with and, and turn them into your own and, and implement them into your own office's culture. Um, it is extremely difficult sometimes to take uh, corporate best practices. They tell you to plan six months or a year, and that's not a reality on the Hill. Um, but the people who are here right now, they have, they are living <laughs> the, the same experience you are. The offices are not that much different. Every member has their own idiosyncrasies. Um, all of your budgets are extremely cramped. And, uh, and the people here have, have, have found a way to, to, to create success with the tools that they have. So that's really great. Um, Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit of a reverse order. I wanna to get to some questions a little bit, but I have, I, I'd like to allow our witnesses to give like a, an important point that they would like to make. What is something that you think is unique to your office or, or, or semi-unique, but it's really central and important to the culture of your office? And how do you, as a, how do you replicate that either as a manager or how do you as a staffer who's being managed ask for your manager to try to replicate that in your office? So Paige, why don't you kick us off? Thanks, Yuri. Uh, something that is really unique to our office that I'm really proud of is how strong of a connection the DO and the DC staff have. Um, I uh, had just kind of noticed as I was setting up our office and going through orientation that that seemed to be a rift between a lot of offices and cause some tension. So. Uh, I knew from the beginning that that was something I always wanted to avoid. So I've just, you know, always kept the all staff calls to include the DC and the DO and uh, make sure that, you know, everyone's work feels valued and we're leaning on each other. And um, I really, you know, do everything I can to lift up our district director and make sure the entire team knows that, you know, she's valued and leads an incredibly important team. And, um, you know, our staff retreats are really important to that as well, but just making sure the entire team feels really close, even though we're in different places. So how do you create, like, what are the, the things in place? So when I was um, in a personal office, one of the things that, I, that we constantly get communicated to us in the district, in the DC office was that they didn't know what we were doing in DC. And it was frustrating because they had to go in the community and tell the community what the, what the congressman was doing in, in DC. And one of the things that we implemented was um, an end of week email. And I don't like newsletters or, or, or busy work, but it was an end of week email that could be put together in under 10 minutes. And it just had the top lines of these are the committee hearings that I attended. These are the things they voted on. And here, um, and here are the bills introduced and, you know, really could just be filled in cut and paste. And then last one was one, it was like, here are five things that are interesting that happened in DC that are like, you know, in the news cycle that you might not have heard, but it were like all the buzz in DC, whether it's the, you know, debt limit or, or, you know, or something that was, or something going FCC passing net neutrality, but whatever it was. So, um, and that improved DCTO relations so much by just acknowledging what their problem was and then providing a solution for it. Do, do you have things that you've seen that could be implemented that help improve it? Because yeah, uh, the, the tension between the district office and the DC office is almost universal and is very limiting and limits the success of a member if, if they're not working hand in hand. So what, what, what would you put in place if, if you were to go to another office to replicate that? 
Absolutely. Uh, so I think something that's really important to us is, you know, of course, communication. So uh, we do an all staff video call twice a week. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, our legislative director gives an update about what's going on on the floor for the week. And the district director gives an update about, you know, events going on in the district for the week. So um, they're kind of viewed as equally as in, important. And um, I think it's also just level setting with everyone in the DC team frequently that our center of gravity is in Dallas. And you know, the, the first priority should always be responding to the district staff when they have questions and need support. So um, I think those those video calls where also everyone goes around and gives just a quick update of what they have going on for the day. Uh, so then everyone, you know, feels like they uh, are heard and are also listening to their colleagues. That's good. I think that a good call out there is to is creating a culture of respecting and responding to, uh, to your colleagues emails and respecting their time and I think some, the, the worst breakdowns are when the district or the DC office sort of ignore their colleagues emails that, that's, that causes the biggest divisions so thank you um, Ryan would you like to share sure um, one thing um, that I stress to our staff I say it often is um, is we are not family um, a lot of times you'll see on TV companies will show, you know, we're just one big family and we have a family environment. And I tell people all the time, uh, no, you have a family and family comes first. And um, so, what, uh, so what I try to do is be as sympathetic. Uh, and part of this is just communicating with your staff and having just brief chats with them periodically, know what's going on in their lives so that if someone's wife is pregnant and they've got a doctor's appointment coming up, having them know that it is absolutely expected that they would go to the doctor and that it's not a, um, you know, to see the sonogram as opposed to feeling guilty about approaching your boss and say, can I take half a day to go? Um, but, and so I'll say all the time, like I, I want everybody on our team to get along and we all row in the same direction, but at the end of the day and at the end of your time in this office, you have a family and family comes first. And um, we need to we need to accommodate that. I've had staff who had a uh, a mother who had terminal cancer, and um, and she was very sheepish about taking time. And I said, no, like this isn't this isn't vacation time, and this isn't and it's not technically sick time. This is just time, and we're not going to count it against it. You need to leave on a Friday to fly home to spend the weekend with your mother, so you have a couple extra weekends with her before she passes. That's, and it seems to me very common sense, but I've seen um, not other offices on the Hill, but just other companies talk about like a family environment where we stay late. And it's, no, we, we work hard, but um, your, your family comes first. And I've found that people appreciate that to get it builds loyalty with the, with the staff. Yeah, you know, I, we were talking, someone else brought up the idea that you treat, Mutre brought up the idea that you treat your staff like professionals and, mm -hmm. and they will, and they will respect that and appreciate it. You know, for me, I came up through that same system, right? This belief that the hill makes you tough, that you have to like be at your desk even when everything's like, even if you don't have any work to do. And it was very counterproductive and very frustrating um, and and not very fulfilling or rewarding. And it was, uh, it was actually when I left the hill for a while and I went to go work for a labor union where I learned that uh, a contract is with an employer is not there to keep you <laughs> for, to keep you for a time certain amount of time, but really to guarantee your rights in the office. And it was the first time that I had an HR person who would tell me, "No, these are your benefits. These are your vacation days. You are expected to use them. Use them now." And I took that stuff at the heart that we should that when we outline uh, roles, responsibilities, um, benefits, and expectations that we encourage people to, to use their benefits. Um, uh, and, but then also to have, you know, respect for people as individuals to that, like you said, that if there are uh, extenuating circumstances that their family comes first and, 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 and people remember those moments. I think you're absolutely right. And it just creates a more wholesome kind of uh, culture in your office that isn't just based around um, competitiveness and who stays at their desk mm -hmm. longer. <laughs> ben, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, thanks, Yuri. I actually think that um, both Paige and Ryan really uh, hit on important things that I suspect, like, you know, the, the 
seven highly effective habits or whatever, I suspect there are common threads, uh, just like um, making sure that the DCDO relationship is, is strong. Uh, we definitely, um, from the beginning, have, have sought to involve and include uh, our DO staff and in, in, in folks. And, you know, to Ryan's point about flexibility, I think that that's, that's really important uh, to project in it, uh, you know, uh, for us, really, we're lucky that it comes, there, there is buy-in on all these things uh, from our boss. And, and, and so that, that really helps. Um, and it's important, I think, to seek it if, if you don't have it, to, um, to, to sort of look for that um, uh, involvement and interest uh, in, in sort of staff lives. Um, I think that uh, one other note, I guess, is that uh, it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic, but um, we found the tools of Zoom really brought our DCDO staff closer together, and, and we've been using Slack as well, and that's been uh, uh, another way to keep folks uh, connected, and I think that's a, that, that's a huge part of yeah. what makes people um, excited to be with us, hopefully. So prior to the pandemic, um, do, what are the things did you do to keep the DC and DO office engaged? Did you, did you do retreats in the district? Where do, um, do staff go, are encouraged to go back and forth for training or meetings or anything like that? Um, yeah, speaking for, for our office, yeah, we, we, we did all those things. We, we, 2019, we were able to have a retreat uh, and then 2020, everything was was different, right? But we, in May of 2020, we did our first sort of Zoom mini retreat that really included, it was a half day, and the first half of the half day was sort of, you know, ledge parts and comms parts, but we got somebody from um, uh, uh, the Office of Employee Assistance uh, to, to, to do a mental health sort of part for, for everyone, because in, in May of 2020, that was really, um, an important sort of thing to consider. And I think that, you know, going forward, that's an important feature, uh, that, that we'll be adding. And we actually did one earlier this year. So, um, I think that that sort of engagement, we got, uh, some of our, our junior staff to, to do some presentations as well. So, uh, hopefully they felt a part of it as in that process. And Mutre. Yeah, I guess maybe uh, after hearing from, uh, you know, my colleagues here already, I, I might add, I think a lot of these things are ideas and, and stuff that we have all probably seen work for our team. But it's not to say that every office should try and implement, you know, these, these types of things. Um, like I think Paige was talking about having, you know, bi-weekly meetings with everybody on. And, and our team tried that to bring the district office and the DC office closer together. Um, and after doing it for about a month, uh, my district director called and, and was like, look, like we don't care about like 80% of this stuff, right? Like we just, like we wanna do our thing and like keep banging out the casework and, and take care of our grants portfolio. We can pick up the phone and call our colleagues in DC and if we have questions, right? But I don't care if we signed a letter about a, a tax credit for X, Y, or Z, right? Like, do we need to be doing this every week? Um, and that sort of made us revisit. We said, no. So we sort of took our Monday meeting and we said, all right, we're paring this thing way down. This, if this thing goes over 10 minutes, it's gone too long. What we want to do is flag what's happening in Washington for that is going to be important to the people back home, right? Like, what are we going to get phone calls on? Because other than that, like, you know, we do do kind of separate jobs and let us just, you know, have the space to work within our own jobs. Um, that's not to say that some teams don't need twice weekly meetings or some teams don't need any weekly meetings, right? Like, like you need to implement a system that works well for your own office. Um, so listen to your to your district directors, listen to your LDs, and then figure out what the best way to integrate it all is is for you. But it's it's not a one size fits all. Yeah. So uh, before, we're gonna, the we, we haven't got any questions in the chat. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, we did get some some 
uh, and, and I'll call on you, but we did get some other questions and I kind of want to touch base on some of them. Um, you know, there was recently um, a change to the maximal, maximum uh, allowable pay. Um, and so there, you know, there is somewhat of a narrative that the maximum allowable pay ends up taking away from junior staff. And I, and I, as a monetization committee, I, we push back on that pretty hard that an office is trying with good managers spends um, its MRA in a, in a way that supports its team. So, you know, I would love to hear from someone who has any tips for kind of maximizing um, their MRA so that their staff receive uh, fair compensation. I'd also love to hear tips on how you handle uh, the discussions around uh, promotions uh, and, and pay increases so that you set expectations so that people feel like they have a future, but also are able to spend more time focused on the, the work that they have right now, rather than figuring out how to how to how to set themselves up for a, a perceived promotion. They can they can focus. Any tips on those types of management, I think, would be really helpful. I know that as a junior staffer, I spent way too much of my creative energy thinking about my next step, what my next step was, and I look back, and the, the happiest times I were was when I spent all of that creative energy finding projects to work on and to create. So any tips on, 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 on making junior staff feel uh, appreciated, supported, and, and with a path for the future would be appreciated. I'm, I'm happy to hop in, Yuri. Uh, so for our office, um, my, um, my boss grew up in Dallas and was raised by a single mom and ultimately got to have an internship in the White House when he was in law school, but he was only able to do that because he had played in the NFL for five years. Uh, otherwise his you know, mom, who was a public school teacher, wouldn't have been able to support him, which is oftentimes what's necessary for an internship or an entry-level job out here. Uh, so we set our values early about you know, paying our junior staffers uh, enough that they could you know, live in DC, work in our office and not have to take on a second job. So um, we frankly kind of built the salaries up from there and just took a lot of cues from the average salaries, but um, that's one of the values that we live in our office. Uh, and in terms of, you know, keeping folks excited about like opportunities for growth in the office, uh, I think making sure that people know that you know what their goals are and, you know, seeking out opportunities for them to take on a little bit of a portfolio or sit in a meeting and just making sure that, you know, they know that you're kind of keeping an eye on their growth and looking for opportunities, whether it's in your office or somewhere else on the Hill, but um, they know that, you know, their, their goals are valued, frankly, as much as their work is. Great. Anybody else? Um, one thing that I do uh, often, at least every six months, I try to closer every three or four months is to sit down individually with every staffer and talk about their career growth. And I'm, I, I, I am brutally honest with uh, the staff to tell them that I understand um, that <clears throat> their future may not be in the office, um, that, that they're ambitious and they want to keep growing. Um, but I, I try to get directional accuracy from them. Are, are you somebody that wants to go make a, a million dollars or do you want to be uh, the head of AEI and at a think tank or do you want to be a staff director or a chief of staff or do you want to run for office or are you kind of tired of public service? Do you want to go home to the family business? And um, I think being open and honest with them. And um, I tell them ahead of time that I remember when I was younger, uh, the most difficult thing to do is to um, apply for a job and try to keep it a secret from your boss. And I tell them that, you know, once you put your time in here, if, if we have an honest conversation and you say, I don't feel that I can grow in this office, I will, uh, if you want to loop me in, I will go to bat with you, before you, with whomever uh, you're applying for, uh, because I understand, and I, I'm, again, honesty, transparency, communications, um, telling them we have a very limited budget. We have a, not only a limited budget, but we have a limit on the number of actual human beings that can work for us. Um, so you might be uh, absolutely terrific, but if somebody above you who's equally as terrific is not leaving and you're getting the bug, I, I want to be helpful. But, um, but the, the periodic check-ins on where people want to go uh, next in their career, just directionally, um, is helpful because that allows me to anticipate, okay, I know that this person's been working for us for a while. They 
recently got married, probably are looking to make a little more money and they want to, you know, move in this direction. So I can start um, soft restructuring and giving them kind of assignments uh, in the space where they, they want to go and then tell them, I think that taking part in these projects will help you with the, with the goals that we've uh, talked about. Yeah. So we have some questions in the queue, but there's one, one thing I wanted to touch on really quickly that something we found as we were doing our research, both with you all and, and, and um, with Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and, and as we were doing our staff retention section, that um, we found different concerns at different levels and different interests in different benefits and what people were frustrated in their compensation package. And we found that at the junior level, people obviously wanted more pay. Um, and that was also true at the, at the more senior level. But in the middle level, we found um, that staff, it, it wasn't always just pay, it was sort of the, of the benefits package. There was people were in the middle of their career looking around and seeing to themselves that um, I won't be able to afford to purchase a home or start a family um, or, you know, or, or continue my education. And these are all things that I feel really frustrated about. And I know that if I go to the private sector, um, I can continue to, I can, I can do these things, right? Um, and it's not even necessarily, for a lot of these people, it wasn't even more paid. Frankly, uh, unless you're senior, if you leave for the private sector at the mid tier, you don't, it's not always that, that, that giant jump that, that, that people talk about in the news. It's more of a senior thing. So, um, you know, I, I'd love you to share thoughts about at, at some point as, as we continue talking about what you think that as an institution we can do better to support those people in the mid career uh, to ensure that they, you know, that they want to stay and they feel like they have a future. Um, but so we got a great question here, and this is something that we are we are struggling with right now ourselves: is how many of you do formal performance reviews, and what does that look like? So. For us, the um, I don't know if all of you have seen, but uh, the CAO HR, the Human Resources Department, has launched HR Hub with a lot of great resources for managers on it. And that includes performance reviews, sal position descriptions, including some some suggested salary ranges, um, and a lot of great tips for how to you know, how to run an office. And so we're working off of that. But I would love to hear. Um, your experience and what you thought was really successful in your performance reviews and how your staff um, receives those reviews. Anyone want to share? Um, I can jump in on that. We've, we've um, for our office now, we're very um, um, systematic about doing uh, end of year uh, reviews. Um, and one of the challenges really has been trying to find a format that offers both sort of performance review as well as sort of gives people an opportunity to talk about, you know, things that they're interested in and what their goals are. So trying to find that instrument uh, has been a bit of a challenge, but we, we look to, to uh, do the performance review, especially in the context of, of uh, in years where we can do a bonus or raises too. Anybody else want to share about performance reviews? I'll confess that's something that we need to do a much better job with. Um, so I'll defer to my colleagues and listen. Um, I would say, so we, we do a performance review every year. Um, I, I found that the best performance reviews are the ones that nothing that you discuss is unexpected. Uh, that if you communicate throughout the year of, hey, we got to work on your writing skills, you know, you're a C minus writer, let's get you up to a B minus um, and then work from there. Uh, or you're really good at X and Y and I'm, you know, your casework wins have been terrific. Then when you sit down with them, it, it's not a shock. Again, I, I always harken back to good bosses I've had and bad bosses and the bad bosses, the ones where when they say something, it's like, oh my God, I didn't know that yeah. I was doing that wrong. And I wish you had told me earlier because now I'm embarrassed. And then, then you start, you actually stop listening to the um, construct, constructive criticism in a review. Yeah, I mean, a, a healthy uh, boss, like a manager, managee relationship, I think includes criticism. 
um, and constructive criticism. I will say that um, uh, working for Mark Takano was a working for a congressman who was open to constructive criticism made the office work so much better you are a better you are a better employee slash manager if you are open to having that conversation and, and hearing how to improve that gets into this next great question someone put in here is you know um as managers sometimes we we fail right that's just the reality sometimes we uh um because of uh because of planning or because of circumstances um, we have something in, in the way that we set up an office doesn't work how we expect it to it. And, and sometimes that can be really frustrating to our employees. And, uh, it sounds like all of you are open to, to a little bit of, uh, feedback on that, but how would you, how do you think it would be best for a junior staffer to go about talking to their manager and telling them that something isn't working or is, is frustrating or is creating toxicity without, it, it coming across across as an attack, but more as like I want to help the team. Um, any suggestions on that? I think if there's a an issue that the junior staffer shouldn't wait until their annual review to bring it up. Um, I think like the earlier the better, so that can be solved as a team. But I, you know, I just in in our office, you know, what I try to do is be compassionate and direct, and I, you know, ask the same of the team. So. Um, that's just, you know, I think when we're giving direct feedback, it's easier for them to also give it back as well. When it's a passive aggressive office, then it's <laughs> hard to hard to share information up as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to Ryan's point, I think that's a very good one that it, no, nothing that comes up in a performance review should be news. Um, and that's why we try to inculcate regular check ins with with everyone with your with your supervisor. And and that susses out. Uh, and provides, you know, a confidential or um, uh, a secure sort of opportunity to, to raise issues. Yeah, this might uh, go without saying, but, you know, if there are folks in, in the audience here that, that haven't made it clear to their teams that their door is open to come in and have a quiet conversation with them, like, you know, tell them that at the staff meeting on Friday, right? Like make that clear to folks and you may have people that walk in that you just weren't expecting that may have something really insightful to share. Um, but I also always encourage um, our team to share that in a private conversation and not like push back in the moment, right? Like, you know, if the if the member's running late and, and needs to be somewhere and, and maybe whoever is driving them has an issue with how this was scheduled, wasn't expected, get the job done, right? And then come in, talk to me later and we'll make sure whatever or we'll try and make sure whatever quote unquote mistake you you may have seen there doesn't happen again but let's let's get the job done first yeah and you know it's also important to to point out that we we are managers who take this seriously but we are also people and there are great tactics for talking to people and and that includes um avoiding accusation and framing it through the lens of of constructiveness if you come in and say you've you know, you've created this broken, toxic culture and I'm not and no one is happy and, you know, and you need to fix it. it it's not going to be received well. Um, come in there with a, you know, these there's the the old famous that is the the criticism sandwich of like, these are the things that I think work well. And this is something I think is is broken and I would like to help fix it. And here are ways I think that we could improve it, but I'm open to, to other suggestions. Um, and you know, and then you 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 close that sandwich with another piece of bread of you know of a compliment of, of but I think our team is really committed um, to making this this work. We want to see the, the 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 member and the office succeed. So um, you know, talking to your managers like people, I think will will help improve that. I also know that just like anybody else, if if you are perceived as someone who really is committed to the work and doesn't complain and doesn't, you know, take Friday as an opportunity to complain about all the stresses, but as someone who's really, you know, serious and thoughtful and has, and brings up a concern, your concern is more likely to get listened to because it's, it seems like something that is not um, just perceived as a, as a, as a run of the mill, <laughs> I, I hate coming to work nine to five complaint, but as something that needs to be addressed. And so think about it that way. And I think you'll have a, a little bit more success um, you know, we also have this 
giant issue that we've all been dealing with of, of a different type of stress of the last two years. It has been one thing after another. Offices have different kind of models. I think most offices, finally, at least everyone's met each other. There was definitely a period in offices where staff had met. We were hiring new staff who never even met the rest of the team. But have you offered, can you share some things that you've done, you've implemented that um, to address, you know, mental health and burnout and frustration and exhaustion in this new pandemic era of, of, of work from home that can just be overwhelming. I, you know, I, one of the recommendations I saw in here that I thought was in this report, which really, you know, I, the it's funny because we did this, the idea we were gonna have data and it was gonna support what we were doing, but what's really valuable is go through and read the, the back of back page recommendations, the one-offs, and there's really meaningful case studies there. And someone said that uh, something we enforce is a is is, is all staff uh, stand down, which is a military term. I, I learned that when I worked for the Veterans Affairs Committee, I did not serve in the military myself. But this idea that everybody steps away, everybody puts their phones down and everyone closes the office. And rather than setting up a, you know, I have my, I'm taking a, a mental health day or a vacation day, but everybody's still emailing them. It is a, it is a, it is a group effort in like, detaching and I thought that was really great. Does anyone else have any other thoughts on how to do that? Yeah, I think time off has really been key for that and just acknowledging that compassion fatigue is real and those are really difficult cases that folks have been working for the last year and a half. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, like leading by example is important too, you know, saying that like I'm taking a day off or, you know, the boss is doing it because it's important. Um, and also communicating with the rest of the team, like we need to respect that. Like if the legislative director is out for a few days, like no one should be direct messaging her or emailing her, like unless it's absolutely urgent and then that should go for through me. But, um, and then that kind of sets the expectation for everyone else. Like I can do this and they will respect my time. And that is real time off. Yeah. Yeah, I think that we try to do the same thing. Uh, the boss does a good job of, of um, having time that's his uh, when he goes on vacation and that sort of everybody sort of follows that we don't try to bother people unless it's um unless it's urgent and then the other thing is i will routinely hound staff who haven't taken uh time off or there's a lot of uh, vacation days accruing um because i think it's important for folks to take time off and the third thing i'll, I'll sort of add there is that Sort of in the stand down thing, we we often look to do um, in leading into a, a long weekend or something like that. We'll try to to, to give a half a day or or something like that uh, as we lead up or coming out of Thanksgiving or something like that. So um, those have all been helpful, I think. Anybody else? Anybody kind of changes to patterns? Right, and Mutre since since going into pandemic. Yeah, um, I th our team has enjoyed the greater flexibility of telework. Uh, I mean, um, uh, kind of as we all have done it out of necessity, right? Like it has come with a, a lifestyle upgrade for folks, and and so we've maintained a lot of those rules um, that we had, you know, during peak COVID. Um, and and folks are, I think, continuing to enjoy the flexibility to do a little laundry in the middle of the day if they need to. Um, so while yeah. informal, that's where. You know, early, before the pandemic, in my old office, we were one of the first offices to have a telecommuting policy. And that was, uh, that was one day a month during a recess week. And everyone, <laughs> everyone thought that was so radical. Like that was so, and I always just thought that was so funny. But now, you know, we took something that was sort of taboo, the idea that you weren't sitting at your desk the entire time gave people the tools to do, to do it from home. And we saw that it worked. You know, the, the modernization committee, when we look at things that need to be, that are broken, we look at it through three kind of things. One is like, this is broken because it's outdated and it's broken, it needs to be updated. This is broken because there are rules and traditions around it. And we can still update that, but while respecting the traditions. And then there is, this is broken because uh, it, it, it being broken makes something else work. So we have to kind of see it through those through lenses. And I would say that this idea 
that we can't telework was through the lens of it is tradition here that people always you have to sit at your desk you have to be on call you have to you know be available and i think that is something that when we did a, a a real assessment of it we 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 walk away realizing that that wasn't necessarily the case and so you know i recommend i always recommend to offices to not have anything to have hard and fast rules about that are when the culture needs to adapt. And that's something that I think that telework has really kind of highlighted here and is really, is really useful. Um, you know, we're looking at all sorts of other things that I would love to see the idea of a, a co-working space where um, you can get away from your office. It's quiet and it's open to Republicans and Democrats. It's not open to, for you to take meetings with lobbyists or constituents, but it is a place where you can go write a speech and it is a place where you can, uh, it, where you can, when you can collaborate with people from other offices or from across the aisle to on, on ideas you have and form and form them. We all know that how frustrating it can be sometimes in a loud office if you're a quiet person or, or, or if you need some meeting space and it's just really difficult. And now we're dealing with this world of uh, uh, where, where Zoom and Teams aren't going away and our whole 16 person staff are in one person per one room and everyone gets to listen to this conversation. So how do we, uh, how do we set ourselves up to, to succeed as everyone starts coming back in? And these are lots of thoughts we are, we're, we're taking with us as we, um, as we come back in from the pandemic. Um, we have a question here. So if you depart an office, but remain on the Hill, would you as chiefs of staff or senior staff, would you want to hear from departing staff on thoughts or comments, or is that moot given that the staffer is no longer in their originating office? I think that this is going to be pretty obvious, but it would be great if you could give like examples of what you want to hear that is constructive. I would say a million percent. Uh, yes, you absolutely do. I mean, you're never going to get better feedback than from somebody that no longer has an investment in, you know, uh, you maintaining their paycheck, right? Like you're going to get so much, so much more honest advice. So if you aren't doing those meetings, um, then, you know, you, you definitely should be. Um, as far as, as specifics go, I just think you get a level of honesty on all the topics. I, I don't know that I could identify any one or two things that you'd want to ask them about. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that that's, um, and we try to encourage folks to opine in their uh, exit memo um, uh, or even exit interview. Uh, I think that that's, it's very valuable. And for me as a manager, uh, uh, that's valuable for me to hear. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if, uh, if, our, if, our, uh, if our attendees, if their offices even have exit interviews, I think that that's something we need to, as an institution we need to do a better job of and exit and exit memos are pretty common, but they're generally just kind of touching base on here is where the file is and here is where I do the work on. But how do we create a system that allows for self reflection? Is it is it best served through an interview? Is it best served through some sort of survey on culture that people can fill in? Um, I know people sometimes feel like they they are they want to be rosy because they don't want to burn a bridge as they leave but as managers we we want to hear the the the, the truth so we can kind of improve because like, like i said earlier we don't always meet the expectation that we're setting for ourselves and we're constantly improving um is there anything else from your office that you'd love to share about um you know about how your office succeeds how you know, I think something I'd love to hear you talk about is how you keep your team on task. I know that when I became a manager, that is oftentimes one of the more frustrating things early on, and it gets better as you create expectations between you and the person you are managing. But early on, um, there is this almost like a cat and mouse game of of setting deadlines and enforcing deadlines and, and living up to deadlines. And I would, as a manager, I learned later on that you you should tell people that the the only deadline that you're going to fail is if you uh, if you pretend like I forgot about the deadline. If you can't meet the deadline, let's let's figure out a new deadline for you. But how do you keep your teams really on task so that um, you're not spending your time chasing down the, the work that you need for the office? Well, I agree. The worst deadline you can miss is if you just forget about it altogether. I think, you know, having clear communication as a manager about when something is expected to be done and then also making sure that it's communicated if, you know, something comes up or it needs to be late, like that's okay. It just needs to be communicated and not, not hidden from the rest of the team. 
no surprises is what I like to say. <laughs> yeah, you know, there was so, there was someone in who in the report wrote something that I thought was really really important is that the 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 biggest mistake you're gonna you're gonna make um, is trying to pretend that you didn't make that mistake. Uh, if you make a mistake and it was an honest mistake and it was done with good intention, even if it was a, a you know something that you forgot or something that you said offhand. If you come to me and you tell me that you made the mistake, that you understand the mistake that you made, why, and you plan on not making it again, I'm going to back you up entirely and I'm not going to chew you out. Um, but if you hide it from me, I, I, that is a serious, serious offense because we have to have um, a level of trust if we're gonna if we're gonna back one another up. Um. <laughs> You're, I think we're um, we're careful. This is uh, slightly off topic, but I think we're careful to give people room to do their projects the way that they want to accomplish their projects and, and not have them feel like um, we're looking over their shoulder. Um, so if, if um, I talk to an LA about putting together a proposal on a certain subject, right, and say, all right, we'll talk about it in two weeks. Is that enough time? Right? Like, I'm not going to bring that up to them until, until we get to the time that we have set. And if they're not ready, then that's a big issue, right? Like what went wrong in this whole process? But asking someone for updates every three days or every four days, I think is counterproductive yeah. and is bad for morale. Um, yeah. You know, like that, that's like I said, treat people like professionals, hire, hire people that are going to be able to do it. First of all, you know, if someone just isn't going to be able to work in that, maybe they weren't a good hire to begin with um, and then let them do their job. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I would love to ask is I think we have people on here who want to be managers one day, right? And that's not something that's common on the health, frankly. Um, people who become legislative directors often are legislative assistants who want a fancier title and more money, but not necessarily understand that the job is really a management job. Um, and so if, if you want to be a manager on the Hill, um, what skills do you think you should start trying to learn and how would you go about learning them? them at an earlier point in your career? Um, I'll weigh in. <clears throat> like I said, I, I had a unique path to the Hill. I, my first job on the Hill was as chief of staff. And, and as you said, many people are LCLA, LD, and then they become chief. Um, I had managed before um, a, a staff and a budget before I went to the Hill. Um, one thing that I did, and I encourage everybody, whether it's an intern doing an informational interview with me or, or anybody on this call, is find a couple of people that I say, like, have what you want. They have the job that you want to get. You want to be a chief of staff one day or whatever the case may be. Um, and check in with them periodically and find out what their job really entails. Um, because I, I know to, um, to some of my junior staff what they assume that I do all day. And it's not anywhere near, yeah. not anywhere near as glamorous. It's a lot of management and a lot of personnel and HR and um, making the trains run on time. It's not exactly sitting with my boss, like coming up with a solution to Medicare. Yeah. Um, but uh, but do if you do not manage right now, um, you have to be aware that being a, a chief of staff is a lot of management and, um, and talk to others other chiefs or other former chiefs. That's what I did because uh, I was nervous about going into the hill from from outside the hill. And I met with a lot of chief friends of mine, and um, they they gave me kind of this kind of advice as like the train band and Heather were talking about. Like this is what oh, I'm sorry, Paige. This is this is the job, and these are the skill sets that you have to work on over the next year or two. And then once you properly develop them, then then you'll be ready to go. I think it's important if you're like a, a staff assistant LC uh, to look for opportunities, even even to manage the interns and and to seek out. Uh, to, to do well. Yeah. You know, I, I, I always say to people who want to become managers on the Hill, um, get involved and your junior, get involved with staff associations now and become leadership at staff associations because you are setting assignments for people. And I know that it seems easier to manage people when you set their pay and you, uh, you know, and you, and you control their promotions. 
it still requires the soft power of uh, encouraging people, setting expectations with people, um, and helping them and setting them up for success. You, it, you will never be a successful manager if your only implementation tool is is you're going to be fired or not. <laughs> like you have to learn that soft power, and you can learn that by getting involved in staff associations. I think that is a really great way, it, or uh, not just staff associations, but also you know community and nonprofits and 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 places where you would see yourself running a project. Um, that is management experience, and that will set you up for success later on. Uh, I also like to always make this plug: if you are looking to find better, more ways to to network. Um, Coffees are great and uh, and staff relations are great, but what's even better is um, finding opportunities to volunteer with other other staff because volunteer opportunities are times when you make yourself uh, vulnerable and open to an experience and helping others and you are you open yourself up to that experience you're in right now so do others and you are more likely to make meaningful connections with others when you or set yourself up in a position like that. So find good opportunities to volunteer, and I think you will you'll see a lot of success. Um, and I'm going to offer this opportunity. No one needs to take it, but if you feel free to share any closing thoughts um, on, on 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 what you think makes a good manager, um, anybody want to share? Otherwise, we can we can wrap it up. Nope. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you all for participating. Thank you all for attending. Um, please go to uh, the link I included uh, to check out the management, uh, the staff attention guide that we did, which was from some of the best managers you'll, you'll see on there. Um, if you are a manager, we ask that you try to take and implement some of these ideas. And if you are a junior staffer, we ask that you share them um, with your managers to encourage them um, uh, in a productive way to, to continue to add to culture. It's also on you to, to, to add to that culture, to buy into the plan that your manager is creating for creating culture in your office. And so um, with that, thank you all again. And, and we hope to see you at our next brown bag. I think the next one is on um, GAO services, which are really pretty fascinating. There's a lot of things that you don't know that you can receive from GAO until you hear from them. Um, and that's gonna be on Friday at 11 a.m. There'll be a link going on. Um, with that, thank you. Have a great day.